I think some of uh, really the exciting stuff, we talked about lidolidamide and some of the work that's being done um, at, at various centers around the world is that lidolidamide with our chop. So how can we improve on our chop? If we want to use our chop as basically tailoring the our chop as your anchor, then the addition of lidolidamide, uh, even in the upfront setting, what we call R squared chop, is demonstrating uh, improvement in outcomes in, there's two major groups by gene expression profile, the activated B cell and germinal center B cell type. The GCB type actually does better up front with standard therapy, but the ABC actually has uh, a worse overall survival, progression free survival. And again, we don't have the full data, but from work that was done, especially by Nowakowski and work in Mayo Clinic, is that by looking at historical controls, matching them, that using r square chop and looking at the ABC phenotype, it appears to bring up those curves, the survival curves, up to the level of the GCB, which is the better prognostic group. I think it's pretty exciting to be able yes. to apply some of the molecular phenotypes, as you mentioned, to prognosis. And this ABC subgroup, as you mentioned, is a difficult subgroup, but it appears that lenalidomide is having its impact in that subgroup. So the application of such technologies as nanostring will allow clinicians within a very short turnaround to actually be able to identify what patients are ABC in real time to be able to use that to stratify patients for what type of therapy. That's very exciting. I think the complexity, though, of diffuse large B cell lymphoma you know, is, you know, is being expanded with these, with these molecular tests. And it's a, it's a very common question that we get where patients prefer because the, you know, this is unlike the follicular lymphoma where you can treat right. the disease is going to come back. This is a disease really where you get one good chance to cure the patient. And you know, so you really want to be doing the right thing and in, in molecularly characterizing and, and getting them getting patients, particularly these double hit patients or the ABCs or the subgroups, onto the right you know onto the right therapy or a trial. And and so, I think there's say we're sort of doing a circle around where in the past you know I think community doctors were more and more com, 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 as a competent yeah. and, and confident that they could treat. This was an easy. This was an easy disease to treat, child, and now yeah. it's becoming now it's becoming a disease that we're seeing more and more referred by the community because you have all these subsets, and, and the field is really changing. On the risk of uh, maybe sounding controversial, it has been said that the uh, your best shot is the first shot, and you have to be able to do it, give effective therapy to these patients. But I'm not so sure with the advent of newer therapies. Obviously, if you have chemotherapy and the only option for relapsed patients is more chemotherapy, that's not a good thing. Uh, but who knows, maybe the paradigms will change in that you may have more than just one shot on goal. And with respect, for example, the, 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 worst, the worst prognostic group, we also see that there is activity not only with lidolidonide, but also that with ibrutinib in the ABC phenotype, and also data that we worked on in the laboratory, but also there's trials with uh, proteasome inhibition, maybe by uh, having resensitizing or having it more sensitive, those cells are more sensitive, or resensitizing to killing what we're looking at in the recurrent or resistant. But that is a very dismal group. I think, John, just to repeat what you said, I mean, basically, patients with large cell lymphoma, it's basically either you're cured or it's a death sentence, you're gonna die. And that you're true, we sometimes have one shot. And those patients, it was interesting, some data that we've known, but to repeat, is that if you fail salvage therapy, you may have at best 10 to 15 percent chance of being alive, you know, three to five years after uh, you felt even with the transplant. And those data certainly have undergone some updating since the era of, of chemoimmunotherapy was actually initiated for basically using R-CHOP instead of just CHOP. One of the things that's also important to remember is so we have a large national study looking at R-CHOP plus Velcade trying to help improve um, the differences between GCB and ABC. Mm -hmm. And we have some early preliminary data from um, Leonard looking at that benefit. And it really does look that you can, you know, sort of overcome that negative prognostic value by using Velcade in that regimen. So there's a lot of interesting stuff that's coming out that should really hopefully be able to overcome some of those poor prognostics. I think one of the things that's most important about large cell lymphoma is that we've gotten a lot better at indicating who do we need really to worry about. And when we talk about this entity of malignant lymphoma with features intermediate, mm -hmm. you know, between DLBCL and Burkitt's, you know, yeah. sort of the old Burkitt-like, and then you look within that group and you see that some of those are double hits, and then you look within the mm -hmm. large cell lymphoma group of those who are double hit, 
you know, we are getting much better at characterizing these cases. And so knowing that, knowing that these double hits are not going to respond well, really could actually help us plan better for our patients. I think all very good points. I think a couple more points would be one question that uh, we can address is what is the benefit of using actually something that we utilize in uh, Hodgkin's and anaplastic, brintuximab, vedotin, uh, SGN35, the CD30, uh, the antibody basically that uh, actually has a payload which is MMAE, a very toxic agent. What's interesting is that in uh, a trial ongoing now is in patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and typically CD30 can be expressed on a subset of these patients. But I think what was very interesting in trials is that even patients where when you try to measure CD30 either it's very low or in some cases they've seen responses with the CD30 negative, we're not quite sure what the mechanism, but it's very interesting that it is it the that we can't measure CD30 very well on immunohistochemical stains or by flow or that you don't need very much of these uh, immuno, uh, drug toxins these or drug conjugates to in get inside the cell to kill it. But I think there is ongoing information in the next year or two, we're gonna see that those type of immunodrug conjugates as a whole new field that uh, is now because of the able to get a, a strong uh, bind or linkage that doesn't allow these very toxic agents to break off and predominantly allow them to be delivered internally to the tumor cell is actually an entire field. I and think, also be released yes. within the field, within the cells, True. to have the desired efficacy. I mean, we've had a lot of, yes. of agents that were nicely delivered, just not very efficacious in the past. Very true. Myron, there's one yes. uh, interesting issue um, uh, about the interim PET scan for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So we all know there are a lot of data showing that if the patient has interim PET scan being positive after a couple cycles of RTROP, that seem to indicate a poor prognosis. So interestingly, there were two oral mm -hmm. presentations yes. during this ASH meeting talking about um, treatment strategy based on the PET scan. So if the patient is having a positive PET scan after two or four cycles of RCHOP, then uh, either continuing RCHOP versus escalating them to some higher intensity therapy. Mm -hmm. One of the German studies was using a Burkitt-like regimen. Yes. And then the uh, British uh, Columbia Cancer Agency was using uh, our uh, ICE therapy. So escalating therapy with uh, positive uh, PET scan, whether that would change the patient outcome. But interestingly, I think both studies seem to show that that does not seem to change the uh, poor outcome. And once the patient um, remains PET positive after a couple of cycles of RTOP really indicates that they're chemo refractory. So you really have yes. to think about some biologic therapy or other clinical trials to investigate those group of patients. And I think that's the whole point. We're, we're being able to identify with various mechanisms, including functional uh, type of imaging with PET scan, we're identifying who's the worst patients, but we still do not have the ability of finding what is the best treatment for those patients, but that's a good learning curve. At least we can have those patients. I think what I'll have to just state is that it's very critical, not only to us in academics we do this, but also for the physicians in the community to refer patients. We need to re-biopsy these patients, and we need to have tissue to basically, that if we can get that and, and, and enough of tissues available, we can study it and try to figure out what are those mechanisms. We have novel therapies with novel targets, but if we don't know which target has been modified and changed, or increased, we're not going to be able to help those patients. I think at that point,